got bombs and bullets on other innocent uh, brown people who's never bothered us. And since his comeback, he'd been brutally beaten by Joe Frazier and had his jaw broken by Ken Norton a year before. Overweight and out of condition, but Ali could still talk a great fight. Because the stage is set, I'm 32 years old, my legs are gold, this man is strong, you talked about how great he was, and now we're gonna see. Get them all out at your theaters, and you write everything you write, but I'm gonna make you eat everything you say against me, all of my critics. I don't prove to the world that I'm still the fastest, the prettiest, the most classic, the most scientific, the greatest fighter of all, all time. That's right. Fight, right. I'll be able to go out there when the bell ring, measure him up, set him up, and hopefully knock him out. 25-year-old George Foreman was the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Undefeated in 40 straight fights, Foreman had destroyed Joe Fraser inside two rounds to win the title and had demolished Ken Norton in equally devastating fashion. With just one of his punches to the solar plexus, sufficient to break the spine of an ordinary mortal, Foreman was at the peak of his awesome power. To be honest with you, I'll fight 20 more Hamlin Ali's in any, any given day for $5 million. <laughs> but well, he says now he can stick and run and beat you. Well, he'll definitely have to do it if, to beat me, stick and run. <laughs> I'm going to be running him through the jungle. Zaire, in the heart of Africa, was an extraordinary choice for the fight. Formerly the Belgian Congo and center of the continent's slave trade, the country was now an equally desperate black one-party dictatorship. President Mobutu had lured the most famous fighters in the world with the prospect of $10 million. Uh, I think we were all startled, like Zaire. I mean, that did seem to be a bit way out, a bit bizarre. And as it turned out to be, that, exactly that. The deal had been brokered by an unknown black hustler called Don King. When you got, when you got to see me in those pictures? I did. You did? In my office? Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Ali wanted to achieve something, and I gave him the opportunity. He was the biggest guy in the world, but he couldn't get George Foreman. I got George Foreman. Dick Sattler was uh, the manager of George Foreman. He didn't really want to deal with me. Uh, and so I dealt without Dick Sattler because even at the time that George was getting ready to sign those blank sheets of paper. Dick Sattler was still saying, well, champ, now just wait a minute, champ. You know, don't, uh, uh, champ, you know, you got to see what we're going to do, you know. And George just almost like, like uh, a God was in his plan, and he was just signing blank pieces of paper. Unheard of. A remarkable feat for a man who'd never promoted the fight before and had been in jail, convicted of manslaughter only a year earlier. Uh, Zaire was a truly black experience because it was two black champions with a black promoter. The black promoter had never promoted a fight in his life. He was going to a country that never had a fight before. Didn't know what a satellite was. Didn't know anything about transmitting a fight. We had a stadium, didn't have seats. Had just concrete things in it. We ordered tickets for it without having seats. That's insanity. From the moment he stepped foot on African soil, Ali was hailed as the true champion. A fight coming up with George Fulmer, I will feel as though he is the stranger coming to our home to fight me in our country. He used to say that he, he was more famous than presidents and he was more famous than the, than, than the queen. And I think that was true for that time. I mean, he used to say, I'm more famous than Jesus. When Jesus was alive, there, was no, there were no satellites. If you took him up in an aeroplane and dropped him out of the plane on a parachute, anywhere in the world, it wouldn't matter where he came down, whoever was the first person to come and meet him on the ground would instantly recognize him and would instantly smile because everybody enjoyed him. Everybody in the world, I and mean, he was, for a time, unquestionably the most famous man in the world, bar none. If you had told me I'd be 
offered a professorship to teach philosophy and poetry at Oxford and speaking at Harvard, man, I never would have believed this. And I'm just a boxer where most boxers can't even talk. Ali had become an international icon. You couldn't invite Joe Frazier, George Fulman. To Yet in America, his conversion to Islam and growing involvement with the Black Power movement and Malcolm X had divided his followers. Zaire felt like the homecoming. Ali was in the midst of the civil rights struggle. He was in the midst of the struggle for Vietnam, uh, against Vietnam. And, and he, uh, it became very important politically. It was a black awakening. It was, this fight transcended any title fight I've ever been in, ever. There's, there's just never been one of the importance that this fight had. Bowman's dawn arrival in Africa was greeted with polite respect. I think that Mohammed, like Joe Frazier and all these guys at this stage, can only do what I let them do. And I'm not intending to let them do much. Happy only in the ring, Foreman hated the primitive conditions in the countryside, soon switching to a high-rise apartment in the center of Kinshasa. It came with his own siege mentality. Foreman, on the other hand, was up in his penthouse, being burly and had two huge police dogs uh, of the kind that the Belgians used to suppress the blacks. You know, like the SS was up there with black uniforms. I mean, they, he really needed to be around with two huge police dogs. At the invitation of the president, Ali and his entourage took up residence in the official palace at Enseli. The palace, complete with luxury liner, stood on the banks of the Congo, now Zaire River. But across the river was a jungle, and, and that was no backdrop. You know, that, was no, that wasn't a movie studio, that was the jungle, with lions in it, and there were huge alligators who would come cruising down the river. And, and he would say, I, I, he started, I really am an African, you know. Hey, this is Africa, back. I can remember standing in, in, in the main street of Kinshasa one day and I saw an unattended car catch fire all by itself, spontaneous combustion. I, I still don't know what happened. Yet as serious training got underway, nothing could mask the threat which the champion posed to the aging Ali. boasting you all. I don't say I'm boasting or I'm a cocky fella. I'm just talking the truth. Because I know. Fighters know when fighters are in condition. That's right. Fighters know when fighters are in condition. Right. The press knows when we are in condition. That's right. See, tell the press knows. Oh. You can't hit the button. The press knows. I'm not going to destroy him. There's nothing you can... This man has been talking since he started boxing. People have broke his jaw, knocked him out. One guy knocked his leg so far up in the air, I thought he was going to take off. <laughs> and he got up and started talking. So there's no way I'm going to be able to stop him from talking. <laughs> I'm not... And then, with less than a week to go, Foreman sustained a serious cut. Even Ali was taken aback. He went out holding it with a towel. This let me know that it must have been something with a little depth to it, maybe wide or deep in some way. Even one stitch would be enough to stop it from with something being so close. And uh, I feel as though somebody close to me just died. It's a bad thing. Everybody's on the way here in planes right now from all over the world. Arena's been rebuilt for it. And I've trained so hard and he's trained so hard. And the whole world theaters are sold out. And, uh, it's a $10 million cut is what it was or more. $50 million cut.
President Mobutu demanded military precision, and difficulties with stadium preparations had already led to a spate of executions. With the possibility of the fight being cancelled, many thought Don King's neck was literally on the line. It's a mark of, of uh, as we came to know, his uh, uh, resourcefulness, his inventiveness, his survivor abilities. Don King was on the verge of being shot in, in, in Zaire. Well, it was extremely difficult, but I was so up on being there that it didn't, you know, the difficulties, you know, didn't mean too much. You had to overcome them. And in so doing, you know, we worked very hard because after all, these people were not used to high technology in putting some of these things together. And so you had to bear with them. And that's why Mobutu was using it as sort of like uh, uh, a symbol, so to speak, you know what I mean, to demonstrate that they, they were doing, they could do and would do. And so we had to work with them. It's no different than working in any other foreign country. All the copy had to go through the censor. Mobutu had to be accorded his full title. And it went on and on and on, you know. Mobutu, President, Lord of the Heavens, Master of the Lions, all that had to go in the copy. Of course it came out. Don King's biggest problem was how to prevent the champion from leaving Zaire, never to return. George wanted to go home. So, uh, and he wouldn't talk to nobody. He was just dead set on going home. And if we know if George ever got out of Africa, he wasn't coming back. So the thing was to keep George in Africa without him taking homage to it. I predict that whenever the fight is set, he might not show up. For Ali, it was time for a show. I just want all helicopters guarded, private boats, private jets entering this space. I want the airport. I'm serious. I want the president. I want all of you Zions to be on guard. Watch all strange boats slipping in. We might take them out. Watch the bus station. Oh. Watch everything. Watch the, watch the elephant caravans. He might sneak out the elephant. Watch everything. Please, Dick Sandler, slick. And Archie Moore's quick. Watch everything moving, unidentified <laughs> objects leaving Zaire. Please watch him closely. The man won't, the man won't out. The man won't out. And the delay bought Ali four more weeks of hero worship. Suddenly, quite spontaneously, this crowd, they all began to chant, Ali Boumaye, Ali Boumaye. And I went around to something and I said, what, what are they saying? And they said, they're chanting, Ali, kill him. <laughs> and I told Ali this, and he, after that, he, he used to conduct the crowd, Ali Boumaye, come and he used to orchestrate the thing. I saw this guy become truly one with the African people and, and revel in being there, absolutely motivated beyond anything, beyond winning a title fight, beyond winning a title or just being there. He became motivated, really, to become the number one black in the world. I was eating this, what I thought was chicken one night with Ali and, and Dundee and all of them. And I said, I like the chicken out here. Thank God there's something I can eat. And he said, what chicken? He said, that monkey and chips you got there. Foreman was undoubtedly deflated. Should be a report about it that I'm ready to fight healthy. And if nothing happens between now and the day of the fight, there will be a fight on the 30th. And I'll be doing my best to win. And as evidence, everybody's seen what I do. I go out and try to do the same thing to everybody. I won't be trying to change tactics. And Ali's camp really got to work. George Foam would train after us. So we had George uh, Howard Bingham, the kid, uh, the photographer with us, and he had these telescopic lenses. So we would spy on George Foam's train. <laughs> And we, were, we set up the spy, so we had a spy and such in every day, practically. We had a lot of fun. 
Boudini and a, and a couple of those guys to relay to Foreman's camp that Ali was poisoning his food and his water and so on. And he believed him. He was like a child. He believed in anything they told him. So he started had to send to, to America for food and was sending to America for bottled water. I mean, they, by the time they had him turn around, he was, he was so, he hated Africa. He wanted to get out of there. He wanted to just finish the whole thing. The people hated him. In the meantime, Ali's got this Barnum and Bailey circus going every time he does a thing. And the thing is befitting that 1974 stage couldn't be set no better that I retire this man just like I did Liston. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Angelo yeah, Dundee. Is that all the time I get? Okay. Thank you, Bandugabula Bula and Dick Don't do that train <laughs> Don't do that train <laughs> Wherever he went, thousands of people would show up. And he went everywhere. And I had lunch one day in the restaurant in the hotel, and I saw the waiter chase a rat across the floor of the restaurant. That's the sort of place it was. <laughs> Yet amid all the hype and kidology as the fight approached, the Ali camp knew that the bookies' odds of up to five to one against their man were devastating. They were extremely nervous. And it was such a large entourage. There were so many people living off them that they, they could sense that, um, uh, well, in, in sensing that Ali was in, in serious trouble, they could see their livelihood going out the window. Without him, they didn't have a job. His only hope seemed to depend upon his unique dancing style. If at 32 he could keep on the move, he might just avoid a knockout blow. Ali was ever confident. His whole plans are changed for this fight, and it destroys a man when you have to change your whole style for one fight. His flat-footed style will not win. I plan round by round, I win my rounds by round, I win the most rounds easy, so he's out to dance until he catch me. And he's found out that after four rounds, three rounds of dancing, he gets tired. And he's found out I'm dancing for 13, and the, the odds are, to the smart man, is Muhammad Ali will not be knocked out. I've heard you say in the past that when the plans for a fight don't go right, you resort to brutality. Do you That's think, right. <laughs> do, you think, do you think this is likely to be a case where you might need some brutality? Who knows? You really don't know. But I've always got that in store and a George who looked capable of not only defeating an army and knocking him out, but doing a serious injury. I mean, and that's what a lot of us felt, that we would not only see Ali beaten, we'd not only see the end of his career, but we would see a man um, in serious uh, peril of his life. First thing I said was, what's the closest neurological hospital to here? Madrid was the closest, by the way. There, was, there were no facilities to take care of him if he got hurt. If he got hurt, he would have died because there was no place to take him. And on fight night itself, there was one final round of shadow boxing. In a move which was to assume enormous significance after the event, Ali's trainer was accused of loosening the ropes of the ring. Oh, well, it's not true. I tried to tighten the ropes. The ropes were... We had 24-foot ropes for a 20-foot ring. And when we got there, the ropes were, and we tried to tighten them again. Tough night. Angelo loosened the ropes, but that wasn't unusual. I mean, Angelo never let anything go by. He, he knew every trick. He still does. <laughs> More than 70,000 people are sitting here tonight under the stars of this hot and humid African night. The time is 4 a.m. here in Kinshasa, and we wait now for the most extraordinary heavyweight championship of all time. The atmosphere was one of deep gloom. We like we were going to a funeral. I remember looking across when Ali came out, and there was Dundee and Bandini Brown and uh, young blood and Pacheco, and he stopped and said to them, because they were quiet, you know, they were nervous, and he said, hey, come on, you don't think I can win this? So the seven-week wait, almost over, 
and we're only seconds away from the man who represents destruction and you're looking at him and Foreman is looking at Ali and the man who represents grace and skill and cunning what a prospect this fight has in store Foreman walked straight to Frazier when he won the title and he destroyed him with huge swinging punches and this is what he's trying to do right now to Ali and Ali is going to trade punches with him by the look of things and that is a surprise for a start we thought he'd done but he looks as though he wants to slug it out so this fight is not 30 seconds old and we've got the first sensation Ali is dancing, but he is also slugging, and he is also connecting. They're going to test it and see who's got the heavier punch. Good right from Ali. What an amazing man Ali is. He's decided to come in and take Foreman by surprise. That's the first good punch of Foreman, a left hook. This is going to be a fight to the finish, Foreman smiling. And the finish might not be very far away if they keep this up. Clayton is having a real struggle in there to prize these two apart. Ali elbowing him, trying to tie him up inside, mauling him inside, and looking for the big shot as well. They can never keep this pace up in this heat. The body punch is absolutely ripping into the ribs of Ali. Sheer, savage, violence in this opening round. exactly like the start of the Foreman Frazier fight. Ali says it's his last fight and he's going out fighting. What a start to a heavyweight championship and people all around the stadium are getting to their feet and clapping their hands above their heads. What a start and Ali has taken a lot of him a lot out of himself in that opening round and Foreman almost looks as though he enjoyed that. Dick Sadler grins, so does Foreman. They couldn't have expected that Ali would come to them like that, and that might just be exactly what they want. He came out and did all the things that everybody said he mustn't do. Uh, he had to run, he had to keep away. And, uh, he defied all that and came out and did the unexpected. the ropes they're saying to Ali the unpredictable Ali again no dancing no running away toe to toe slugging and these massive blows of Foreman are getting through to head and body Ali trying to get the left jab to work around the right eye of Foreman. You've got a stick they're saying from Ali's corner. They want the left jab. No more slugging they're saying. 
Ali tried to take him out in one round and it didn't work. And there is real violence in that ring, believe me, there's hatred. And the crowd is berserk with excitement. He's talking to Foreman even in the clinch. is going right on the borderline from Foreman and Ali is taking a lot of punishment in these opening two rounds somehow he's told himself that he can now punch this man and it's beginning to look doubtful those going through from Foreman. Ali getting the odd one back at him, but taking a lot. Good punches from Ali. But paid back in full again. This is like a street fight. It's not like a boxing match. There he was on the ropes, doing exactly what we didn't want him to do. Apparently to us, he was taking a big shellacking. Of course, what Ali was doing, he, he was covering up on the ropes. But in doing that, he was putting himself in terrible danger. And he took tremendous shots around the kidney. I mean, he, he was urinating blood for, for days after. Round three. Look at that expression on Ali's face. Foreman's eye holding up. No sign of damage there. Marked slightly under the right eye, but not over it. There's an urgency about Foreman. He wants to get this over. And he's doing what he did to Frazier some years ago, Ali. He's shaking his head when he gets hit with the big one. Taking all this and hoping that Foreman will fire. He surely, Ali, can't go on taking this sort of stick. A fight to a finish like two men lugging it out on the cobblestone. Both of them now beginning to feel the extraordinary pace and the humidity. Both gulping in air as hard as they can go. So I got scared to death because he kept leaning. Muhammad's leaning in my corner. I hit him a resounding whack on his butt and tried to get him off the ropes. I was scared he'd go through the ropes. He'd, he'd sort of peep between his gloves, you know, and he'd go pop and he'd go, and then he'd say, you got another 10 rounds of this sucker, 
pop, you know, amazing. So it was no quick, destructive job by Foreman tonight. No Joe Frazier succumbing in two rounds. We're in the fifth. strange thing to me that Ali is putting the punching power of Foreman to the test tonight and the punches that destroyed Frazier are not having the same effect on Ali. Ali knows more about the infighting than Foreman. A lot of these punches are going around the back of Ali's neck and on his arms, but some of them are getting through. <laughs> Ali looks as though he's posting this one. <laughs> Ali hardly thrown a punch for a minute. Covering up, trying to take them on the fists and arms. And he doesn't seem to want to come away, or maybe he hasn't got the strength from the legs to come away. Or is he just letting Foreman punch himself out? How do you know with this incredible man? Foreman bites his lips and goes back in and says, what have I got to do to put him down? First punch is for two minutes from Harley. And Ali looks out and he winks at somebody over the rope. There's the bell. It's the most amazing fight I've ever seen. How did he come back in the last 30 seconds like that after standing on those ropes and taking everything? Come up the ring stairs, all oh, I mean, it's happening right above us. And we said, get off the ropes, get off the ropes. Even Saria was screaming, who can't speak English, was, was screaming in, in, in uh, Spanish, get off the ropes. He just came back and said, shut up, I know what I'm doing. Stay the heck off the ropes. I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm doing. You know what you're doing, you're going to get killed. Guy's going to push you right out of the ropes, get out of there. So, you know, I tried my best to dissuade him, but he had it in his mind, he, he's going to use that rope a dope. action in the early rounds has had. It's left the bear of them now very, very tired. Now 
Now he's boxing into bits now. As Foreman slows, so the openings present themselves for Ali. Nothing in those punches. And still he talks to him. Ali's round. Mohammed was slapping him around. Mohammed was keeping him off balance. Mohammed had him going ring around the roses, keeping turning, moving. Uh, that's what Mohammed was doing. And uh, he did everything he was supposed to do. Beautiful. He took um, Foreman and a clinch into his own corner, and Archie Moore came up, and uh, Ali in a very quiet voice, but you could hear it clearly from there, said, be quiet, old man, it's all over. Foreman's right eye is coming up, quite a ridge of flesh forming above the right eye. This is where he was damaged in training. And the puppet is now beginning to show on the left-hand side of Foreman's face as well. Look at that. Just made to flounder. Good right hand from Foreman. Best punch he's thrown for some time. Still Ali doesn't want to come out of the corner. takes an almighty breath as he comes out of that corner. He's found a bit of extra strength in this round, Foreman. Looks a little more effective than he has been, but sometimes he looks around his ring as though he isn't sure where he is. This heat and the humidity and the pace of this fight really must be getting to them. Both of Foreman's eyes looking puffed up. Ali looking quite unmarked. Good round from Foreman, this one. He's made all the running, and he's scored with some good punches. So he has found something. And suddenly, Ali looks very tired indeed. Ali at times now looks as though he can hardly lift his arms up. amazing thing and Foreman's still on the floor among all that crowd and they've only just got him off. Have you ever in your life seen anything like that? He fought his own sort of fight and people now are going mad. Stools are being swung, the police are in, the batons are out. 
approved that Allah is God. Right. Elijah Muhammad is a messenger, right. and I have faith in them. And regardless of the world and the pressure, I made it an easy night because Allah has power over all things. And if you believe in him, nothing, even George Foreman, will look like a baby. It wasn't a close fight, was it? No, it no, wasn't no, a close no, fight. No, no, no. no, no, no. no, no. no, no. Gotta stop talking now. Attention. I told you, all of my critics, I told you all that I was the greatest of all times when I beat Sunday Liston. I told you today, I'm still the greatest of all times. Never again defeat me. Never again say that I'm going to be defeated. Never again make me the underdog until I'm about 50 years old. Right. Then you might get me. But I didn't dance. I didn't dance for a reason. I wanted to make him lose all his power. I kept telling him he had no punch. He couldn't hit. He's swinging like a sissy. He's missing. Let me see your box. I hadn't started dancing yet. You can't say my legs are gone. You can't say I was tired because what happened? I didn't dance from the second round on. I stayed on the ropes. When I stay on the ropes, you think I'm doing bad. But I want all boxers to put this in the page of boxing. Staying on the ropes is a beautiful thing with a heavyweight when you make him shoot his best shots and you know he's not hitting you. I would have gave George Foreman two rounds of steady punching because after that he was mad. And here, finally, is a tape playback of the great moment. When George went over, he kind of looks to the corners. All fighters do if they've still got enough left in their head when they go down. And he looked. And they weren't there, but it was all over. It gone. It was the end of it. You pull the ripcord. Uh, you floating down, baby. And that was it. Ali psyched him, outfought him, outmaneuvered him in in his mind. He was the boss. He was the maestro. He was the symphony leader. He was tremendous. He was a superhuman. And when he came in and said, black is best, and black is beautiful, you had but to look at him. I coined the phrase that every knee must bend, uh, every head must bow, every tongue must confess, thou art the greatest of all times, Muhammad Ali. George Foreman was devastated by the defeat and retired from boxing, only to make a comeback in 1987 at the age of 38. He is still fighting, and last month, at the age of 45, he won the WBA and IBF titles against Michael Moore. I thought I'd knock him out in one round. Beat him up the first round, beat him up the second, third, fourth, but he's still there talking to me in the fifth. That's all you got? I said, what in the world have I ran into? I had not conserved one ounce of energy. This guy was still confident. He was getting more confident. I had a fight on my hand. The next thing you know, he hit me with a one-two combination. I was down on the floor. I got ready to get up. My manager told me to get up. When I jumped up, the fight was over. I had lost my title. Never been so devastated in my life to lose the title and to the most braggadocio in the world, Muhammad Ali. It took me a long time, maybe a year, before I could sleep again. Muhammad Ali successfully defended his title on a further 10 occasions before losing and then regaining the heavyweight championship for the third time. He finally retired just short of his 40th birthday. His health declined quite rapidly and he has been suffering from Parkinson's syndrome ever since. His tragedy was that he loved his life so much that he wanted to prolong it in the spotlight. Uh, the tragedy became that a man who could have been a tremendous leader for his people came muted by an illness caused by boxing. And, and that is, in effect, when Muhammad Ali, that I knew, came to an end. If you look at it, Ali's losing the battle in life, but he's winning. And that's probably why it's not a tragedy. <laughs>